hold on, I gotta bring my audio up as well. Okay. All right, y'all. Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. I come on every week at uh, Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, so that's why we're here. Then I come on the second Thursday of every month with a teaching entitled No More Genies, where we talk about getting rid of our genie concept of God and uh, listening to what the word actually says. Okay, so uh, let me say a prayer. We're going to dive right into this week's prophetic word. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to know you and to serve you. Oh, God, I just ask you, Lord, I just die to myself right now. I just take up my cross and ask you to speak through me, oh, God. Let what is said be what you want said to the glory of your name and the edification of your saints so that men's heart might be cut to their heart, oh, God, that they might be led to repentance, that they might turn from their own thoughts and their own ways back to you and to faith and love and obedience towards you, oh, God. And uh, have your way, let the Spirit of God breathe through me, so that you might be, again, glorified in all things, that all words spoken might be what you want. And I thank you for it, and I believe you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Today's prophetic word is rebuilding. Today's prophetic word is rebuilding. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, I'll tell you exactly what I mean. What I mean by that is when we get through this beer bug situation, uh, I won't name it if I put it on YouTube, I'll get flagged, so I'll call it, the, you know what I'm talking about, the, the plague that is all over the world. We're going to call it the beer bug. When we get through the beer bug situation, we're going to have to rebuild. God has taken his mighty hand and has torn down everything that we had. Financially, every industry has been impacted. The medical industry is overtaxed and overstressed. Um, and everything that we thought we knew and everything that we thought was solid and every way of man has been torn down. And so what's going to happen if you survive this? And let me be clear, everybody's not going to survive this. Okay. Uh, part of what's happening now is judgment and some people are dying and some people uh, just simply aren't going to make it through this. In my life this week, I've had to deal with four deaths uh, close to me. I had one person that was a friend and a colleague that committed suicide. I had uh, two people from my church die. Uh, one was a man, part of a fabulous couple. Everybody loved them and knew them. Just a, you know, a man that loved his wife and everything and came to find out he had passed. And then another member's mom had passed. And then uh, close to my family, someone I grew up with, the son of actually one of my spiritual mentors who mentored me in the prophetic, he died unexpectedly, just in his sleep overnight. <coughs> so, just that was just close to me. So there's no one that hasn't been touched by the situation that we're in now. And every system and everything of man that we had, God has taken his mighty hand and shut it down. So what that means is that if you survive this, and some will survive and some will not, we're going to have to rebuild. So what the Spirit of God impressed upon my heart was to release to the saints, why would we rebuild in something that God wasn't pleased with? My son said something to me that's been resonating in my heart and my mind ever since he said it. And that is that, what were we doing? In other words, we go to church two, three, four, five hours a day. What are we doing? Are we rolling on the ground? Are we putting on three-piece suits? Are we have a hat parade? Are we arguing over chicken dinners, we arguing over where people said, what were we doing? What makes us think that God was pleased with what we were doing? Arguing about the worship, arguing about the worship leaders, arguing about the worship styles. That crept in in the 90s. Before the 90s, we went to church and we sang until the power of the Holy Ghost came down. When the 90s hit, uh, what happened was Starbucks began to rise and we adopted more of a Starbucks. We, we had the idea we could build a perfect cup of coffee and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with Starbucks. God bless Starbucks. Ain't nothing wrong with having your gourmet custom cup of coffee. But that mentality crept into the church. And then we started saying stuff like, well, we don't want choirs anymore. We want worship teams and we want these kinds of songs and we want this, but we don't want that. And we all of a sudden thought that the worship of God was a smorgasbord. That's when that started. And then we started arguing and dividing. And to this day, people still go to church. Well, I like this worship or I like this worship leader. I don't like that or I don't like this style. And that's never been the point. 
of coming to the house of God. Because before the 90s, what the old folks would do is they would sing until the Holy Ghost fell. And they would pray until the Holy Ghost fell. And they didn't care about how they looked. They weren't trying to be cute. They didn't care about that. They cared about the Lord showing up because the scripture says, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. That's what the folks I grew up around when I was a child before the 90s. That's what they cared about. And then the 90s said, and we adopted the smorgasbord mentality, and we've never been the same since. Okay? So what if God wasn't pleased with any of that? Because it's all gone now. Everybody now is in the same boat, regardless of denomination, regardless of age or gender, ethnic group, regardless of what you thought. You're in the same boat now where everybody's trying to have their services online, seeing how many people are watching and ministering. And some people I see are still holding on to their tradition, still holding on to denominationalism. And God called for an end of that. That's over. OK, the only way we're going to move forward is by doing it the way the Lord is telling us to do it. And the way the Lord, that's why people that have adopted the multicultural church angle, that's why those congregations tend to be prospering and thriving more. Okay? So everybody's not going to survive this. Everybody's not going to make it through all this. But when we do, when those that make it through do, how are we going to rebuild? And if we, <laughs> and if we rebuild the same stuff that God just tore down, that means we haven't learned anything. Why would we go through all this stuff with this stuff with a worldwide plague, with a pandemic, with the beer bug? Why would we go through all this and have God shut down every single thing that we thought was important, every single thing we were doing to the point where we can't even go outside? We can't even gather that, that so many states and so many places around the world are on lockdown. Why would we go through all this and not learn anything? That doesn't make any sense. So what we want to do is we want to examine certain things. The first thing I want to examine is <clears throat> how do we call ourselves a Christian nation? How do we call ourselves that? Based on what? Based on what do we call ourselves a Christian nation? Are we saying that our laws are based on the laws of the Bible because that's not true? Are we saying that we have a lot of professing Christians, people that say they're are Christians? Are we saying that we have a lot of practicing Christians? On what basis do we call ourselves a Christian nation? You know how I, I could call that out? You know how I know that's true? That we're just doing that. Because our country is divided on fire. But let me show you in the Bible what happens when a nation pleases God. We're going to look at Judges 3 and 30. Judges is in the Old Testament. Judges, the book of Judges. Uh, let me pull it up here. Chapter 3, verse 30. <clears throat> well, I'll start at 29. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites all robust and valiant men. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was subdued under the hand of Israel that day, and the land had rest for 80 years. The land had rest for 80 years. So the Bible just told you that even under the Mosaic law, even under the Old Testament covenant, which we Gentiles were never under, that was for the Hebrews, but even under the Old Testament covenant, the Mosaic law, they obeyed and believed God enough for God to give them rest for 80 years. That's four generations, because a generation is 20 years. That's four generations of the Israelites that obeyed God enough for him to give the land rest for 80 years. Has America had rest for 80 years? The last 80 years of our existence, have we had rest? Or has the country been on fire? Has the country been divided? Do we argue now about every little thing? <clears throat> Do we get offended now? By every little thing. Where is our rest? And there's your biblical proof that what we're doing ain't working. So when we get into the rebuilding phase, surviving what's going on now, why would we continue to do something that did not produce rest? I just want you to think about that. If what we were doing with all our denominationalism and all our religious traditions, if it was working and if it was right, why didn't it produce rest in the land? If we're such a Christian nation, we have Catholicism, then we have Protestants. Uh, 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 I've been a Protestant my whole life. Uh, we have all these different Protestant denominations, Baptist, Methodist, United Methodist, Episcopalian, uh, African Methodist, Episcopal, uh, Lutheran. Um, what, if we have all that, if all that was right, and what we was doing was right, how come it didn't produce rest? Where's the rest? Because even under the Mosaic law, 
when they obeyed God, they got rest for four generations. Father, son, grandson, and great-grandson all knew the rest of God because even under the Mosaic law, they obeyed God enough to get rest. Where is it now? Where has it been in our country? If what we was doing was right, where's the rest? I stopped by to tell you when we rebuild, we need to do what the scripture says and not what we think. <clears throat> so point number one about uh, us having rest and not being a Christian nation, just in name only. Here come point number two. Point number two is that sin is not defined as people define it. Sin is defined as God defines it. Let me say that one more time. Sin is not defined as people define it. Sin is defined as God defines it. And the only sins that Westerners, Americans, care about is uh, sexual sin. The only sin we care about is sexual sin. All people care about is who's sleeping with who. I don't know why that's true. Okay, even when I was little, I didn't understand why people were so obsessed with sex and relationships, but we are. Okay, and people see you through the eyes of your sexual sin. So if they know anything about your sexual past, that's what they're going to throw in your face to say, well, you did this and you did that. Or you ain't saved because you did this. It will be sexual because what people care about is sexual sin. I don't understand why. Okay, I've never understood why. I'm a grown man. I've been grown for a while. And I still don't understand why all people care about is who's sleeping with who. And people judge your spirituality by whatever it is they know about your sexuality. Okay, I don't understand why that's true, but I know that it is true. I stopped by to tell you that sexual sin is not the only sin in the Bible. I'm not trying to condone anything that the Bible is against. Don't, misunder don't twist what I'm saying. I'm saying that sexual sin is not the only sin in the Bible. In fact... Uh, both times when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and when the Lord spoke out the New Commandment, what God starts with is idolatry. What God starts with is him being first in our lives or not. So let's look at that under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant would be in Exodus 20, verses 2 through 6. Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 6. God says, I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There it is. What's the first thing God said? God said, I'll come first. Then, second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. So in other words, God said, don't you carve out anything in three dimensions. Anything that has height, width, and depth and don't you carve out anything that looks like anything in the earth realm. Because that is not me, says God, and that is not what you worship. And he says that in verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So what did the Bible just tell you? The Bible just told you that God says you're not supposed to be bowing down to graven images, okay? And I stopped by to tell you that that is our grievous sin in America. We bow down to everything but God. Think about it. Think about all the stuff we bow down to. Think about the idols we have made. Think about the things that we have carved out that have taken the place of God, that have substituted uh, putting God first in our lives. And the first thing he said was not to have any other gods before him. Second thing he said was not to make a graven image. And don't you make anything that looks like anything in the earth realm and uh, call it me or don't bow down yourself to them or serve them. Okay? You understand that? Let's look in the New Testament to what the Lord said. The Lord said uh, in Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to start at verses, uh, we're going to start at verse 35. Matthew 22, uh, 22, 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart <clears throat> and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. <clears throat> And the second is like unto it, <clears throat> thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's out of Jesus' mouth. He said, hang all the law and the prophets. So 
uh, when they asked the Lord what was the great commandment of the law, he said to love the Lord thy God with all of your being, your heart, your soul, your mind. Another verse says with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. It includes your body. In other words, every part of your being, God wants us to love him with that. Then he said this is the first and great commandment. And then uh, the second he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He says, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So what did Jesus just say? He just said, any law that I've ever given you and any body I've ever sent to speak to you, what I wanted you to get out of it was to love me with all that you have and to love yourself and then to take those two healthy loves and then love your neighbor, love the one next to you. The Lord said, any law I ever gave and anybody I ever sent, the Lord said that was the point. To love God with all that we have, to love ourselves, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay? Now, just as a little bit of a side, when you look at that word neighbor, we've always interpreted that word neighbor to mean like someone who lives in the apartment or the house or lives across the way. That word neighbor can also be translated next to you. Okay, who is more next to you than your family? If you're married, who's closer to you than your wife? If you're married, who's closer to you than your husband? If you're a parent, who's closer to you than your children? So one of the dimensions of loving your neighbor has not just meant going and witnessing and sliding a track and telling the person across the hall they need to get saved. That's part of it, but that's not all it means. It means to love the one next to you. Who's closer to you than your family? Hmm? Okay? So, that's what the Lord said was the point of every law he ever gave and every prophet he ever sent. Okay? So, then how can we be living in all this idolatry and expect God to bless us? How? And why would we ignore our sin? The whole point when judgment comes for those that survive, because everybody's not going to survive. The whole point when judgment comes is to learn the lesson, to, to learn what God was trying to highlight and to turn away from that which is not pleasing in his sight. That's even in the New Testament because people keep saying, well, that's the Old Testament. I stopped by to tell you, you clearly haven't read Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where the Lord gives grades to each one of the churches. And then the Lord says, I know you're doing this, 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 this right, and I like that, but I have this against you because of this, 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 and this. He gives grades. That's Jesus speaking in the New Testament from heaven after he has ascended, sat on the right hand of God, and become fully God again. That's him giving grades because he walks among the midst of the seven candlesticks, that's the churches, and he has the seven stars, that's the pastors, the apostles, the angels, the messengers, because the word there is translated messenger, angel, or pastor. It means the spiritual leader over that particular church. And Jesus says, I have those in my, my hand, my right hand. So how can the Lord be walking in the midst of the churches and have the pastors in his hand and say things like seven times, the Lord says, no, I held up eight, seven times, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That's the Lord giving grades right now in real time today. Okay? And so we as a culture are full of idols and idolatry. And God has taken his mighty hand and shut down everything we worship to the point where most of us can't even leave our homes. What are you going to do now? And what makes us believe that everything that we were doing was pleasing in the sight of God? Because Revelation 2 and 3 tells us clearly that the Lord has to be the judge. The Lord has to give us the grades. We cannot self-judge. We cannot say that everything we're doing is right or pleasing in the, in the eyes of God on our own. We have to let him tell us. My next issue, my next question is, where is the power of God? What do, I mean, what do I mean by the power of God? I mean, the same kind of power that Jesus walked in, the same kind of thing he said that we could walk in, the same thing that Peter and John walked in, where is it? What if we set up a, a triage center in a church and we said, we told everybody, everybody that's suffering from the pandemic, come in here and you'll get healed in Jesus' name. Where is that? Where is that? Okay, let's look at Mark 16, 7, uh, 17 through 18. Mark 16, 17 through 18, you're very familiar with. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. 
they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Where is all that? I stopped by to tell you, and I'm going to read it later in Acts, that that does not happen because of our own power and our own strength. So when we're walking around with religion and denominationalism and bragging on ourselves and what we've done, then there's going to be no flow. There's going to be no power of God flow because that's us trying to glorify ourselves. That kind of flow happens when we have taken up our cross, when we have decided to decrease so that Christ can increase. We have decided to glorify him above ourselves and glorify his word above anything that we say so that the spirit of God can add his power to the word of God because the spirit of God adds his power to the word of God, the will of God, the purpose of God. That's when the Holy Ghost releases the anointing, not to our purposes, not to our will, not to what we say. So where is that? Where are those signs following? Where we cast out devils, and I know we do that. Where we're speaking with new tongues, I know we do that. We're taking up serpents, drinking any deadly thing, it not hurt them, laying hands on the th sick, and they shall recover. Again, what if we set up a triage center in any church, or what if there was at least a church in every state, or maybe a church in every city, that said, bring the sick in here and they'll get healed by the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Where is that? Okay, let's look at what the Bible says about what Jesus did. Let's look at Matthew 15, uh, 29 through 31. Matthew 15, 29 through 31. Moving on from there, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountain and sat down. Large crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and he laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The crowd was amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Where is that? Why do we wheel people in and wheel them out? Why do people come into the house of God and they leave the same way they came? Why do we have walkers? Why do people come in on walkers and leave on walkers? Why do women come in uh, infertile? And the doctors have told them they can't have babies, and why don't we do like... Elijah and Elisha, and why don't the prophets lay hands and say, if it's the will of God, then, then you, by this time that you are doing this season, you can have a baby. Where did, why aren't we doing that? Where is the power of God? That's what I'm saying. Because the scripture says very, very clearly that we can have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. That we can have religion, but there's no power. Where is the power of God to do like Jesus? Large crowds? Lame, blind, crippled, mute, and many others lay them at his feet and he healed them. And they saw people that weren't able to speak talking. And the people that were crippled, restored. People that were lame, walking, and blind, seeing. Where is that? Okay? If what we were doing was so right, it's what I'm saying. Where is that? But you say that was Jesus. Then let's look at Acts. Very familiar passage, passage, uh, passage of Scripture. Acts uh, 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, he was born lame, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fasting his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Okay? And Peter said in verse 12, and Peter, when Peter saw it, all the people wondering, he answered to the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. There it is. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I was talking about before right there in the scripture. Peter, Apostle Peter, who walked with Jesus, said, why are you looking at us as if it was our power that did this? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're supposed to be walking in. And Peter said our own power or holiness. In other words, Peter was saying it's not because we're so clean or perfect or religious that that happened. That's what I'm trying to say. And people get angry. People just get angry. They get beside themselves when you preach and teach this. But that's out of the Apostle Peter's mouth. He said, it was not our own power or holiness. We made this man to walk. Okay? 
Verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus. So in other words, God glorified Jesus through in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, giving that man the ability to rise up and walk, even though he was born crippled. Where is that? Because that is not Jesus doing that. That's Peter and John doing that in the name of Jesus. Now, they did it in his name by the power of the Holy Spirit, but they were folks. They were regular folks just like us. And Peter said it was not our holiness that did it. Peter said it wasn't our own power that did it. What power did it? The name of Jesus through the person of the Holy Ghost. Where is that? If there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and Father don't change, and Jesus don't change, and the Holy Ghost don't change, and the Bible don't change, then where is that? Okay? The only conclusion is that we changed. We changed. We moved away. Okay? And so, so if we're going to rebuild, those of us that survive, if we're going to rebuild, we need to rebuild biblically because, again, why would we, would we assume that everything that we was doing before was pleasing in the eyes of God? Because every denomination right now, if you notice, is in the exact same boat. Every denomination, I want you to notice that, every denomination right now is in the exact same boat. Okay? So if what we were doing was so pleasing to God, why is everything shut down and everything is level and everybody in the exact same boat right now? Why? Why? So those of us that survive, when we rebuild, we should rebuild biblically, okay? So what's the first thing we should be doing, okay? I'm going to read you these scriptures, and I'm going to tie them together to show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. Okay. Uh, this is this is an intense passage of, of scripture, Matthew chapter seven, verse twenty-one through twenty-three. Okay, <clears throat> uh, verse twenty-one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. See, that blows me away every time I read that. So the Lord says that all of these good works that we're doing, even in his name, he says right then that if we don't have an intimate relationship with the Lord, if we don't know him and he doesn't know us, we don't have that relationship, then all that doesn't count. I want you to imagine living your 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, yeah, even 100 years of life on earth and do a whole bunch of religious good things in Jesus' name only to stand before Jesus to find out that none of that counted. That the Lord says, depart from me, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. I want you to notice that the Lord doesn't even give them partial credit. The Lord doesn't even give people partial credit. If you spent your whole life doing a whole bunch of religious things in the Lord's name, but you don't actually know him, he said that doesn't count. Your whole life does not count. So tie that into what we said before about loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, where he said that's the first commandment, that he wants us to love him. And you can't love God without knowing him. And he wants us to love ourselves and love the one next to us as we love ourselves. So that means what we're supposed to be doing is teaching people, first and foremost, how to love the Lord. Let's go to Ephesians. Okay. Let's go to Ephesians. I know I have that in here somewhere. Ephesians 4, where it talks about the uh, gifts. Okay, I don't think I pulled that up. Well, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 is where he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, pastors and teachers. Uh, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of, of the body, for the building of the body of Christ, so we all come into uh, the fullness of the knowledge of the Son of God into a mature man. So what that means is that as apostles, as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, what we're supposed to be doing is teaching people how to love the Lord. That's supposed to be our foundational teaching because the Lord said, if we're doing all this religious work, but we don't know him, it doesn't count. For the life of me, I don't understand why that makes people so angry. But I've discovered that it does. And normally it's religious people that get angry like that. But be that as it may, 
the scripture says that his commandment is for us to love him with all that we have. And if we live our lives doing a bunch of religious works in his name and we don't really know him, he said it doesn't count. So when we rebuild, it seems like to me we're supposed to be teaching people as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers how to love the Lord, how to know the Lord on an intimate level so that whatever works are done by following his leadership count unto life eternal. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we need to be reestablishing families in the biblical order. That's another one where every time I say that, I see some people just get livid. But be that as it may, I can show you, and I'm going to show you from Scripture, okay, why that's the thing to do. First, we're going to look at Malachi, Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Now, I read it last week. I've actually read it every week for the past several weeks, but I'm going to read it again today. Malachi 4, uh, ch uh, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I want you to notice what he did not say. He did not say he's going to come and teach y'all how to build more church buildings. That's not what he said. He said that if, if you're a father, your heart's got to be towards your children. Teaching them how to love the Lord, know the Lord, live as believers, become followers of Christ. If you're a child, you can't be cussing your dad out can't be disrespecting your parents. Remember the Lord said to honor your father and your mother. And you can't just throw away so much restraint until you're disrespecting, dissing your parents, even though we know they're not perfect. We know that nobody's perfect. But God didn't tell you to honor your parents if they were perfect. Remember that mankind is always the one that expects perfection. Mankind is always the one that said, if you made any mistake at any time, at any point, then you're not saved, you're not good enough, you're not qualified. Mankind is the one that says, you can't be used of God if you're not perfect. That, you know, if you're not perfect, if you didn't dot every I and cross every T from the time you were a child to the time you died, then you weren't really saved. That's mankind that says that. That's not what God says. The Bible says the just man falls seven times and rises up again. God said that his mercy endures from everlasting to everlasting. Why would God say that his mercy endures if there is nothing to have mercy on? Okay? It's people that say, Perfection is the mark of Christianity. That's not what God says. Okay? So God says here that the family, it's the family, or else God's going to smite the whole earth with a curse. What just happened? I done said it three weeks in a row now. That's why I don't care what people say to me. That's why I don't care if they call me crazy. They can call me all kind of names. They can say, I don't care what you say. I'm reading what the scriptures say. I'm reading what the Bible says. The Bible says that if the family's not right, if the father's hearts are toward the children and the children's hearts are toward the fathers, God said, he's going to smite the whole earth with a curse. What just happened? What just happened? What are you living in right now? You are living in the word of God playing out right in front of you. That's why I don't care what people say. What does the word say? So that means when we rebuild, we need to pay attention to what God said. What got the earth cursed? He didn't say, y'all didn't have enough church services. That's not what he said. He said the hearts of the fathers need to turn back towards their children and the hearts of the children. You know what that means in a very practical sense? You need to make it right with your parents. If your parents are dead, then you need to forgive them. There's all kinds of techniques. If you go to professional counseling, you can actually learn uh, emotional healing techniques. One of the techniques that I really like is you can actually write a letter. If your parents are dead, you can write a letter and say to them all the things that you want to say just to get out of you. And you, you begin to see healing in your soul. Another technique is you can set a chair in a room, an empty chair, but you can speak to your father and your mother as if they were there and say all the things you've always wanted to say. And those are just two small techniques that I learned. But the point I'm trying to make is that God is saying your heart. He said the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. So God is saying we have to make the family relationships right or else the whole earth will get smitten with a curse and what just happened. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. So when we rebuild, remember that the first thing that God built was a family. God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. Uh, Genesis 2.18, I will make a help that is fit for him. And God uh, took uh, part of Adam's side and built him a woman and brought her into the man. And God, the first thing the Lord made was a family. That's the first institution God uh, created was a family. Okay? And so 
uh, <clears throat> that's why when families do, when we form families like we're supposed to, then that frees the church to do what we're supposed to do, which is actually deal with widows and orphans. And that's in uh, Psalm 68 and 5 and James 1 27. So we're supposed to be dealing with women whose husbands have died. And we're supposed to be dealing with children that have no parents. Okay, through whatever, if your parents abandoned them, if your parents uh, got sick and died, God forbid, if your parents, God forbid, were in an accident. But if their children have no parents and, widow, and women that have no husbands, that's what the church is supposed to be doing. Do you know what that means? That means that everybody else that's able-bodied that's forming a family is supposed to be taking care of their families. Okay, so that's number two. I'm going to hurry on. Number three, we should be walking in the power of God. Okay? Um, just like Jesus said, greater things than these shall we do. Remember that the Lord is not the first prophet to raise people from the dead. Remember that Elijah and Elisha raised people from the dead. Remember that the Lord is not the first prophet to do miracles with water. Because the first public miracle he did was turn water into wine. But Elijah and Elisha did miracles with water. Um, and food, healing the pot of stew. And Moses did miracles with water in the wilderness. Remember speaking to the rock and water comes out to feed half a million, maybe a million Hebrews and Egyptians following Moses out through the desert and the Red Sea parting. So the Lord was not the first prophet to do miracles with water. I say that to say that that means that we can do it too. Now, everybody might not be doing it on that level, but somebody is supposed to be doing it on that level because the Lord was not the first prophet to do miracles with water and the Lord was not the first prophet to raise the dead. He was also not the first prophet to do miracles with food because remember, Manna fell from heaven. Remember, Moses prayed and quails came to feed the nation. Remember that there was sickness, there was death in the pot, and the food got healed. Remember? So that's what I'm trying to tell you, to stop saying, well, the Lord did all that because he was Jesus, when other people in the Bible did it too, both before and after him. So we need to be walking in the power of God, because the power of God shuts all mouths. You don't have to say anything when the healing power of God is present. If you set up a service and people come in crippled and they leave home, that would, they would become your biggest evangelist, people that had known them their whole lives. And they say, what happened? And they say, I went to the house of God and I got here by the power of God. We wouldn't have to say anything. But we do have to preach it and teach it so we can hear it. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we have to preach and teach on that level. So our spirits can become supercharged with faith so we can begin to operate on that faith level and expect God to operate on that level. But we need to be walking in the power of God because you don't have to say anything. When people that have been blind their whole life come out and they can see, okay? And then finally, final point I'm going to hit is doing things that Christ cares about. That's in Matthew 25, okay? Doing, doing things that Christ cares about. What, I'm, what do I mean by that? I mean, I will say again, what if all the stuff that we were doing before, what if God didn't care nothing about that? Okay, let me read a passage in scripture and you'll see what I mean. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So the Lord says when we feed the hungry, when we give water to the thirsty, when we take in strangers, when we give clothes, when we visit the sick and take care of them, and when we visit the prisoners, that's so important to Christ that he takes it personally. He says that when we do that, we're actually doing it to him. How can we call ourselves Christian churches and we don't have a food pantry? Uh, of food and water. We don't have a clothing ministry where we're giving people clothes, where we don't have shelters where we're taking people in, taking people in off the street that don't have any homes, where we're not visiting the sick and laying hands on them and getting them healed. 
and where we don't have prison ministries. Now, I know there are quite a few of those out there, but is that the mark of us as Christians in America? Is that our staple? Is that what we're known for? So when we rebuild, the Lord says he's going to judge all of the nations based on this criteria. So I'm going to say it one more time. If the professor gives you the answers to the final before you take the exam and you still fail, then that's on you. One more time. If the professor gives you the answers to the final and you fail, then that's on you. So we need to be rebuilding according to what uh, the word is saying, what's important to Christ. Why would we not build according to what the Lord said is important to him? And he didn't mention hat parade and he didn't mention chicken dinner and he didn't mention, you know, he didn't mention all the stuff that we seem to major in. He didn't mention all the fancy, all religious regalia. That's not what he said. He said, I'm going to judge entire nations of people by food, water, uh, a shelter, clothes, ministering to the sick and ministering to those in prison. Right there in the scripture, right there out of the Lord's own mouth. Why would we go through this worldwide pandemic and if we survive it, get a chance to rebuild and then completely ignore what the Lord said is important to him? Okay. All right. So that's a prophetic word for this week. Uh, I know I went kind of long, but it's necessary. So that word is on rebuilding. Okay. So if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to go in the Spirit and ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else um, that needs to be released. What the Spirit is saying to me to release is to fear not. Fear not. What does that mean to fear not? Those of you that have received this word and want to walk in it, there's going to be a lot of religious opposition. There are going to be people telling you that you're not saved because you're trying to do what the Bible says, okay? If we want to rebuild and we want to teach people to love the Lord more than anything, that we love him with all our heart and our soul, because that's what he said. And we want to teach people to know the Lord. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be people that fight you tooth and nail, even though the scripture says you can live a life and do a bunch of religious work, and if you don't know the Lord, it doesn't count. There are going to be people that fight you. The Holy Ghost says, fear not. If we want to restore the family order, you know people are going to fight that. You know, if we live biblically according to the family order, and just let me say on the side that God has never meant for us to use his word to abuse people. A lot of people have taken the commands on the family and have abused people with them. And I'm saying to myself, that's why the first thing is the first thing. Bishop Jake says that all the time. Bishop Jake says, let the first thing be the first thing. Amen and amen, Bishop Jake's. And the Lord said, the first thing is to love the Lord. I stop by to tell you, if you love the Lord and love yourself, why would you desire to abuse your wife or your husband or your family or anybody near to you? That's why Christ and loving him is always first. That's always the first thing. It's putting God first and loving him and knowing him. But then restoring that family order because I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what they call me. I don't care how many names they try to call me. I don't care what they try to say about me, David, personally. Who does David Taylor think he is? Blah, 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 blah. I don't care. Because I read the word that says the fathers have to have their heart towards the children. And the children have to have their heart towards the fathers or else the whole earth is going to get cursed. And right now the whole earth is cursed. That's why I don't care. I'm reading what the scriptures say. So the second thing we got to do when we rebuild is get the family order right. Because as the church was supposed to be caring for widows and orphans, that means that everybody else that has families is supposed to be taking care of their own family. Okay? Number three, we should be walking in the power of God. Because remember, now the, the thing that the Lord did first, but not only because he taught us to do it, the thing that the Lord did first was cast out demons. You don't really see anybody casting out demons the way the Lord did. Now, the word demonic strongholds are broken because when King Saul had the evil spirit got from God come upon him, David would come play his heart and the evil spirit would leave him. And so Old Testament prophets would use music to go in the spirit and evil spirits would be broken. But the way the Lord did it, calling him by name, 
and a whole bunch of things. The Lord kind of pioneered that in the way he did it. But even under the old covenant, there were unclean spirits whose power was broken when the worship of God came forth. I'm only saying that to say that all of these things that the Lord did, we're supposed to be doing them too. There were people that walked in the prophetic under the old covenant that did them before the Son of God even became a man. So that's what I mean when I say we're supposed to be walking in the power of God. The power of God will, will shut mouths. What, I'm going to say it again. What if we set up a triage center and we said, everybody that got the beer bug, come in here and you'll get healed in the name of Jesus. And everybody that came in, got healed, and they came out and told everybody, I went to the house of God and got healed. Okay? So we need to be walking in the power of God. And number four, we need to be doing things that Christ cares about. And Christ gave us a detailed list. Once again, that's the professor giving you the answers to the final before you take the test. Christ gave us a detail of this. Christ said, I'm going to judge entire nations of people. Once again, I don't care how they talk about me. I don't care what they say about me. I'm trying to read the Bible. One more time. I don't care what they say about me. I'm trying to read the Bible. And the Bible says that at the end of the age, the Lord is going to gather entire nations of people in front of him. And he's going to judge Nations of people based on how they treated these people. People that were hungry, people that were thirsty, people that needed clothes, people that needed shelter, people that were sick and people that were in prison. And the Lord said, if you do it to them, the, le the least of these, my brothers and my sisters, men and women, okay, men and women, so don't try to put no sexism, is it? sexism in it, okay? He said, my brothers and my sisters, the Lord specifically said, men and women. So we're supposed to be ministering to men and women. In other words, it's not supposed to be a gender restriction. Okay, we're not supposed to be persecuting women or men in the name of Christ. The Lord said, my brothers and my sisters. And he said, if you did it to the least of these, he said, you've done it unto me. So why would we rebuild and not rebuild with that in mind? Food, water, clothes, shelter, sick and shut in, prison ministry. That's seven things the Lord said that he cares about, that he takes personally. Why would we rebuild any other way? All right. Amen. God bless you. That's a prophetic word this week. Again, I know I went long, but uh, I think it was necessary to, to get that word out. So, um, okay. Uh, it's a prophetic word coming. I got to release it. For behold, says the Lord, I am in my word. I speak through scripture. I speak through the Bible. In my word, uh, my words are spirit and they are life. So heed the teachings of my word. Search ye the scriptures and build according to my pattern, according to what I have commanded in the word. And as you build according to my word, you will be able to stand. You will be pleasing in my sight. You will turn from your own way and build according to my way. And then will I hear from heaven and will uh, forgive your sin and heal your land as you build according to what my word says, says the spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. That's what I want to do. I want to build according to what the words say, okay, because that's what the Lord says. Amen. Both in the written word and through the rhema word, the prophetic, okay? All right. That's why I always teach with scripture. So you can see I'm not just pulling stuff out of thin air and I'm not just making stuff up. I'm reading what the scriptures say. We don't like it because it cuts against our flesh. We don't like it because it cuts against what we think. We don't like it because it glorifies him and not us. But he told us that the way to follow him is to take up our cross and to deny ourselves and to do what he says do. We have to take up our cross, deny ourselves and follow him and do what he says do. Okay? Amen and amen. So thank you for tuning in. Thank, uh, thank you to those of you that are listening to me on the podcast. Thank, uh, thank you to those of you that watch me on Periscope. And on my Twitter, thank you to those of you that watch me on Facebook Live, and thank you to those of you that are watching me on YouTube. Amen, and God bless, and I'm busy trying to be about this myself um, so that I can build according to that which is pleasing in the eyes of God, okay? Because I don't want to keep going through this, this worldwide plague. I don't want to see if anything comes next that's worse. I, I, don't, I don't want any of that. I want to repent. And I want to turn my thoughts from my own way to the ways of God and obey according to the word of God. Okay? All right. Amen, amen. God bless. 
I'll see you uh, next Sunday, same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Amen. God bless.